Howdy, it's Kyle talking about gentrification. Just the mere mention of the word brings chills up and down the spines of a lot of people. It's usually associated with negative things. In this video, I'm going to talk about gentrification in general and then talk about six very specific cities that I'm very familiar with to see whether or not it's worked there. The six cities I'm going to discuss in detail include Chattanooga, Tennessee, where I live, and also Detroit, Pittsburgh, Atlanta, San Francisco, and Charleston, South Carolina. And all six of these have undergone loss of gentrification through recent years and have had various levels of success. And it's probably going on in the city you live too. It's been going on in many other cities throughout the country. But these six I'm very familiar with. So I'm going to discuss gentrification in these cities and how it's affected them. Gentrification is essentially taking old, low-value property and transforming it into higher-value property. And of course, this is going to have a huge effect on the neighborhood or even an entire part of town, as will this be a huge transformation in the type of property and what's going on in that part of the city. Back in the 70s and 80s, it was referred to as urban renewal, but it was often sarcastically referred to as Negro removal because a large percentage of the population that was affected were part of the poor black community in the inner cities directly adjacent to downtown. Nowadays, it's called gentrification, but it's basically the same thing where most of the people that are being affected are part of the poor black community in the inner cities. Now, I'm not going to downplay racism in the U.S. It's a lot worse today than it was 20 years ago. But what's going on with gentrification isn't really racism. And it's not kicking out the black people. and It's not even necessarily kicking out the poor people. It's just taking these neighborhoods that are occupied by poor people and turning it into more high value properties where they can charge more in property taxes. But because it's directly adjacent to downtown, it's high value property. So the, a lot of the poor white folks live out in the sticks. They live in a trailer park. They live out in a little shack out in the woods. So you don't see the poor white people as much. Everyone sees the poor black gutter. You drive through it all the time. It's on the news all the time because you have a concentration of poverty. You're going to have a concentration of crime. With urban street gangs, you're going to have a lot of shootings and stuff. So you have a lot more attention brought to these poor black neighborhoods. And usually they are pretty bad, pretty dangerous, but because they are directly adjacent to downtown, the property values are higher. So those are just kind of the basics of gentrification. So now I'm going to get into the specific examples of the six cities I mentioned before, starting with where I live, and that's Chattanooga, Tennessee. I've lived here for about 12 years now. We came right before the big wave of gentrification, so we've gotten to see the city change quite a bit in the recent years. The part of town that's seen the most gentrification is called the South Side. And this is the area around the Chattanooga Choo Choo and the old train station. And this had a lot of old unused buildings, empty storefronts, and just a lot of just urban decay. It was the part of town you would go to get a hooker and get some drugs, but it is nothing like that now. It's been changed quite a bit. These old empty storefronts are now trendy shops, a lot of new restaurants there, bars. A lot of it's really expensive too. So a lot of tourists go down there, a lot of locals as well. There have also been some new housing developments in the same area as well, but there haven't been a lot of people displaced because most of these new housing developments went up over old factories or old empty buildings. Right now, there's a big old factory that closed down recently. They're going to turn into a bunch of condos, but no one's being displaced. So the big argument against gentrification is usually poor people being displaced, but in Chattanooga, it hasn't really been the case because, again, most of the new housing has been where people didn't live in the first place. There was this big old church that was no longer used that was raised, and that's now a condo complex. And there was an old car dealership that got raised, and that's now a new condo. So I think Chattanooga has done a pretty good job of adding housing without really displacing people. But the flip side is that things have become a lot more expensive in the city. Costs have gone up like crazy, but wages are flat. And that's pretty much true throughout the entire country. Everything costs more, but no one's making any more money. But in Chattanooga, the wages are so ridiculously low that it's even harder to keep up here than most other parts of the country. But with all that, it's hard to say that gentrification hasn't been a net positive in Chattanooga. You can't tell me that it's worse today than it was 20 or 30 years ago. It's improved a lot. And even though I personally am not a big fan of the city, I'm in the extreme minority because most people not only like it, but really like it. The next city I'm going to talk about is Detroit, and I've got friends there that are basically family. I've been visiting once or twice a year for the past 20 years, and I've seen the city go from wallowing in its own slop to making very slight improvements in recent years. From at least 1998 until just a couple of years ago, there was virtually no change whatsoever in the city except for change for the worse. A ton of people left, more of the city became empty, and it was getting worse and worse. But about two years ago, a certain group of people started to move in, buy up old properties. Whoa, that's summertime in Tennessee right there. 
anyway, what's going on in some of these cities, including Detroit, is that you have a certain group of people, and you know who they are, they're hipsters, have come in, bought up some of these old properties, and turned them into mocha frappa latte kind of places with multi-grain bread and organic fake ham on it. So, But at the same time, these are the only people that have made any type of improvement whatsoever to some of these rough areas around the city. But kind of like Chattanooga, not a lot of people were displaced. The place that have become these kale smoothie kind of places were empty storefronts, empty buildings, empty factories, empty warehouses. So they've made something better out of what was nothing. This part of town used to be nothing. It wasn't even like ghetto. There was just nothing there. And what was there were bums, drug dealers, and prostitutes. So it was a terrible neighborhood. Now it's kind of okay, but... Not a lot of people have been displaced, at least in that part of town where there's a lot of hipsters moving in. And there have certainly been people that have been displaced in Detroit, people that have seen their rents double through the years. But something that's unique about Detroit is that if you're displaced, you can stay within the city. There are so many empty homes and there's so much empty, unused land. You can still buy a house for like 50 grand in Detroit, put 50 grand into it, and it's still way cheaper than anything you're going to get that's a middle class home in Tennessee or Florida or wherever. So you're still not paying as much and you're still staying in the city, even though you did have to move because your rents went up so high. But it's not quite the same as being displaced, not knowing where you can go and then moving 10, 20 miles way out in the suburbs or way out into the sticks. But so far, there really hasn't been any trickle down effect in the city. So politicians always talk about trickle down, but it never really works. They know it never works. So I'm going to hold judgment because the money from increased property tax is supposed to go to community development kind of stuff and to improving schools and roads and infrastructure. So is that going to happen? I don't know. I'm kind of skeptical, but I am going to give them the benefit of the doubt for now because it's been a very recent thing that's happened with people moving in and buying houses and increasing property tax revenue. But just like Chattanooga, I'm going to say that gentrification has been a net positive for Detroit. You can't tell me it's worse today than it was 20, 30, 50 years ago. It's horrible. It's still horrible. It's a giant dumpster fire, but the dumpster fire at least isn't as large now. It's still the worst city in the country, but the gap between it and, say, Baltimore isn't as large as it used to be. I mean, Baltimore is trying really hard to be the worst city in the country. It's getting there. But Detroit has seen a little bit of improvement, so I know people are upset. There have been folks that have been displaced. And some rents have gone up, but it's been a net positive. So it still has a long way to go. But I do think gentrification has been something of at least a little bit of use in Detroit, even though there have been some negative side effects. The next city I'm going to talk about is Pittsburgh. And it's pretty similar to Detroit and Chattanooga in that it was heavily dependent on manufacturing and factories through all these years. And in the 70s and 80s, things went away. So the city became really bad. And it's hard to imagine now, but Pittsburgh at one point was every bit as bad as Detroit, maybe even worse. But it's been improved a lot through the years. What Pittsburgh did is pretty similar to what Chattanooga is doing right now. That It took all those old warehouses and factories and just old unused buildings and turned them into condos and houses and other types of things like that. And they attracted new businesses. Chattanooga went with tourism and different kinds of high-tech stuff. And Pittsburgh went with a lot of high-tech stuff, financial and insurance kind of stuff. Detroit was like, hey, we can still hold on to the automotive industry. It's going to come back. And of course, it never did. So Detroit took forever to make any improvements. But Pittsburgh was like, you know, steel is never coming back. We need to do something now, change what our economy is going to be, and change the city a bit. Because Pittsburgh is more densely packed than Detroit or Chattanooga, there have been a lot more people displaced, but the number of people who have been displaced hasn't been enormous because a lot of the stuff that's being used for new development has been old, unused stuff. So there have certainly been old neighborhoods that have been gentrified, and some of the poor old black folks were forced out because of higher rents and prices, but it hasn't been to the huge amount that you've seen in other cities like D.C., or New York that have just completely Negro removal, as they used to call it. So Pittsburgh has seen some improvements through the years. It's better than Detroit. And that's largely because they accepted the fact that steel is gone and they have to diversify their economy. And people that live there are often like, what are you talking about? This place still has all kinds of problems. You have a lot of gang issues, high crime. It's dirty. It's polluted. The traffic is awful. People keep saying we're great, but what's so great about us? Compare it to, say, Cleveland or Philadelphia or good old Baltimore and it's a lot better. So I'm going to say again, Pittsburgh has been a net positive for gentrification, even though there's still some issues with it. People have been priced out. Prices have gone up a lot. Housing is more expensive, but it's still one of the lesser expensive big cities, even though it has a large high tech and financial presence. 
The next city I'm gonna talk about is Atlanta, and I'm very familiar with it. I visit about two or three times a year, and the situation is a lot different there than either Chattanooga, Detroit, or Pittsburgh. It was never a manufacturing or industrial city. It's the state capital of Georgia, a lot of government stuff there. It's the home of Georgia Tech and Emory, two elite nerdy universities. Emory is one of the most elite medical schools in the entire country. It's the home of the federal government's centers of disease control, and a lot of the federal government's southeastern regional offices are in Atlanta. Ted Turner basically single-handedly turns Atlanta into L.A. Jr., so there's so much media and TV stuff there associated with cable TV. So there's a lot going on in Atlanta that has nothing to do with industry or manufacturing. So its city's history has been a lot different. There was no time in U.S. history where Atlanta was considered one of the worst cities. You know, you talk about Detroit or Pittsburgh used to be, and Cleveland and Baltimore are today. Atlanta was never that city in that grouping, so it's always been kind of a metropolitan, cosmopolitan place with a lot of things going on that had nothing to do with blue-collar workforce stuff. It's a city that didn't really need to gentrify. It's always had a vibrant downtown, a vibrant midtown. The Buckhead high-end area has always been there. You go there now, you're guaranteed to see a couple of Ferraris and a Lamborghini and a ton of Porsches driving around. It's that kind of an area. It's never been like Detroit or Pittsburgh or like how Chattanooga was in the, uh, back in the day. So it didn't need to gentrify, but it still continues to anyway. I looked at Zillow and MLS websites before I made this video to see what kind of property values are going on right now in some of these cities. And I was shocked to see what some of the stuff in Atlanta is going for. A friend of mine used to live in Atlanta back in the 80s and he lived in a part of town called Cabbage Town. And that was kind of a blue collar, kind of rough around the edges area that was pretty multiracial. It was just kind of a you know blue collar neighborhood. Nowadays, it's super trendy and I cannot believe how expensive the house is there. I'm looking at some that are a thousand to 1200 square feet on like a little tiny plot of land going for half a million dollars. I mean, it's ridiculous how much stuff costs there. And some of these houses in Atlanta would be half as much in the part of California I'm from, super expensive California. These houses in Cabbage Town that are going for half a million or more might be 200000 in the town I grew up in. That's a nice town, too. So Atlanta is very, very expensive, and people have definitely been priced out from some of the parts of town that have been gentrified. So in Atlanta's case, I would say that gentrification has not been good. It's only served to make things way more expensive, force people to move closer to the airport or to some of the inner ring suburbs that are kind of rough around the edges. But it's not any better. I mean, I do like Atlanta, but it hasn't improved because of all this gentrification, but it has become a lot more expensive. And the last two cities I'm gonna talk about are San Francisco and Charleston, South Carolina. And believe it or not, these are two very similar cities, even though they're literally on the opposite ends of the country, but they are both tightly packed, densely populated cities on a little tiny peninsula. So they're surrounded by water on three sides and suburbs on the fourth side. So they don't have anywhere to grow. San Francisco can at least grow vertically, so a lot of the development has been high-rises and these new condo towers and things, but Charleston can't even grow vertically because there are building restrictions on buildings being more than four stories tall to preserve the historical character, but these are really similar cities in you know, the geographical setup and what they've done to deal with it. San Francisco was the first major city I was familiar with. I grew up going there a lot. I have family in the Bay Area, so I've always been pretty familiar with San Francisco, and every time I go back to California, I try to make a point to get up there, so I go there quite a bit. And I've seen it change quite a bit through the years. For the longest time, San Francisco was mostly a blue collar town with a lot of banks. It's the second largest financial city in the country with only New York having more banks and financial stuff. So that was the makeup of the city until the Google comes to town and everything changed as a result. The tech boom hit the whole Bay Area and as a result, so many jobs were created and so many people moved to the region. But because there's no room to build in San Francisco, property value skyrocketed. So it's kind of like Manhattan. There's nowhere to grow, tiny piece of land. So supply and demand, basically. So the land is going to be worth a ton of money. Although, to be fair, it isn't quite as expensive as people think because a lot of people in San Francisco don't have cars. And so that means no car insurance, no car payment, no gas. So most people, families, are going to pay $1,000 per month or more between car payments, insurance, and gas. So... It is still very expensive to live in San Francisco, but it isn't as expensive as you might think because you're a good thousand dollars a month. People that live there are not really paying. Originally, San Francisco's gentrification was not that bad because most of it was along the eastern side of the city, along the Bay Shore. So you have the, the San Francisco Giants baseball stadium there. And that whole area was just kind of empty and derelict. So it was good to have stuff there. But then as the city brought in more and more jobs, more and more people moved there. They couldn't really gentrify without taking over owner-occupied homes, 
making sure that people that were renting there couldn't afford to live there anymore, so they were being displaced. So now the only way they can grow is by displacing people that can no longer afford to live there. And you used to be able to fall back onto, say, Oakland if you couldn't afford San Francisco. Now, Oakland is crazy expensive. It's like Brooklyn. It's a bunch of hipsters living there now. So overall, I would say that gentrification has not been good for San Francisco. The city is not any better now than it was before the Google moved there. It's just changed a lot. And you can't even go to Haight-Ashbury anymore and see a bunch of burnout pothead hippies. Now it's a bunch of skinny jeans hipsters with their mocha frappa latte. So the city hasn't improved. It's just changed. And the last city I'm going to talk about is Charleston, South Carolina. And that's another one that I'm very familiar with. My wife is from South Carolina, but not from Charleston. But I've been there a lot. We just got back there very, very recently. And I was shocked at some of the changes I saw. If you're familiar with Charleston, you probably know it as a very historic city with that beautiful battery area in the south part of the peninsula. Those giant, beautiful, stately homes of all different colors right along the waterfront. And those have always been multi-million dollar homes just only super rich people could afford, but it used to kind of end at a street called Calhoun Street. Once you got north of there, it got more normal. They got more middle-class kind of houses, even though they were still beautiful old homes. And the farther north you got, the rougher it got. And there was a part of town that was pretty rough, high crime, a lot of gangs, a lot of drugs. But I went back a couple of weeks ago and it was basically all gone. There's like no ghetto whatsoever left. It's been completely cleared Everything's been gentrified and a bunch of younger people have moved into these old homes that were nice homes, but they were formerly owned by landlords who are renting out to lower income people. But there's literally like one block in the city that is still kind of rough. There's a housing project and stuff going on. So poverty has almost been completely removed from Charleston. And that might seem like a great thing. It's like, wow, they got rid of all the riffraff. There's no more gang issues going on there. But Obviously, the people that lived there had to move somewhere, and a lot of them moved to places called James Island or John's Island, which are, you know, it sounds nice because they're close to the beach and they're on an island, but they're really low-lying. They're kind of swampy, and they're just about the worst place to be during a hurricane except for right along the beach. So that's where a lot of people have moved. Housing values are lower, but even that's becoming more expensive as the peninsula has, is full. You couldn't squeeze another person on the peninsula, so they're moving to some of these islands as well, and it, the cost is crazy expensive. It's not quite as expensive as Atlanta, but it is way, way above the average for cost of living in the Southeast. And wages are okay, but it's not really high enough to keep up with how much things cost. So it's very much like San Francisco, and that you have a lot of people that want these homes on a little tiny part of land, supply and demand. So there's few people, or there's few houses available, but a lot of people that want it. So it drives the prices up. And it drives prices up for everybody. So if you're one of those people that got displaced from the peninsula or you're a middle-class family that never lived there anyway, you're still paying those higher prices because of all those people moving in to the peninsula and paying half a million dollars for a 1,500 square foot house. Right now, Charleston is considered the number one gentrifying city in the country. And it's happened so, so quickly. There's a street called King Street, which is the main street through the downtown. It's always been kind of a hoity-toity street with overpriced antique shops and boutique stores and that kind of stuff but it used to end at that calhoun street and after that it got kind of rough but now it extends another mile so there's another mile of nice shops and restaurants and bars and all the people hanging out it's crazy how fast things have changed because just five years ago it wasn't like that at all so it's been a really quick turnaround and I worry what it's going to be in the long run. And high housing costs has a trickle-down effect throughout the entire metro area. So high housing in San Francisco and San Jose has caused the entire Bay Area to be crazy expensive. And high housing costs in Charleston is going to eventually spread to the rest of the area, not just the city itself. So my overall take is that gentrification can be good in the right situation. I believe it's been a net positive for some of these former industrial cities that had a lot of unused land. So a hipster condo complex with your mocha frappa latte coffee shop might not be ideal, but it's better than an empty factory or a warehouse. But if the only way to gentrify is to push people out by rising costs, then that's when you start to have a problem with the whole process. I hope you found the information in this video useful. If you did, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve and subscribe to this channel if you're interested in hearing about stuff about U.S. geography and ranking things and road tripping across the U.S. and just some nerdy stuff about the U.S. But yeah, Thanks for watching. Geography King, signing out.